everybody, I'm Rob Sims and I'm excited to welcome you all to the 8th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tam Nate, starting in 20 minutes. With me and... Uh, wait, where did Tam Nate go? I'm right over here, Rob. Thank you for thank you for being on the show. I was just getting myself a Tim Tam. Tim Tams are my favorite biscuits. But the thing is, I discovered these at a conference in Australia and I'm wondering how can we make up for that lost human interaction at physical conferences? Well, I don't want to spoil the episode, so if you join us in 20 minutes, I'll be more than happy to answer this and many more of your questions. Sounds good. Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Sims, and I'm excited to welcome you all to the eighth episode of Tech Life Skills with Tam Nate, starting in 20 minutes. With me and... Uh, wait, where did Tam Nate go? I'm right over here, Rob. Thank you for thank you for being on the show. I was just getting myself a Tim Tam. Tim Tams are my favorite biscuits. But the thing is, I discovered these at a conference in Australia, and I'm wondering how can we make up for that lost human interaction at physical conferences? Well, I don't want to spoil the episode, so if you join us in 20 minutes, I'll be more than happy to answer this and many more of your questions. Sounds good. Hello everybody, I'm Rob Sims and I'm excited to welcome you all to the 8th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tam Nate, starting in 20 minutes. With me and... Uh, wait... Hello and welcome everybody to the 8th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. Thank you very much for joining today's live stream. I hope you're all staying safe, hope you're all keeping well. And before we get into today's webinar, I do want to start off by giving a huge shout out to all the dads out there. Hopefully, uh, despite the social distancing rules, you've been able to spend some good time with your families. I mean, as a, as a good example, I feel like I wouldn't even be hosting today's webinar or maybe even working with the world of technology if it weren't for my dad realizing how much I loved his you know, laptop at such an early age. Uh, and so on this platform, I do want to wish a very happy Father's Day uh, to my dad and every dad out there. And so, moving on to today's show, today on Tech Life Skills, we're going to be talking to someone who I feel is kind of hard to introduce. And the reason he's hard to introduce is because it's difficult to really put into words what it feels like um, to interact with him, uh, or really even to know him. And the reason for that is because he is just so incredibly friendly. He is so uh, passionate. Uh, he, he's so eager to share his knowledge. He's so energetic, and that energy really is contagious. I mean, even just spending a couple of minutes with him, you end up learning just so much. Much. And so I'm not going to keep you waiting any longer. I know you're really excited, and so I'm very happy to introduce our special guest for today. His name is Rob Sims. He is the Global Head of Customer Advisory Boards and Councils at Google Cloud. And so, hello, Rob. Welcome to the show. I'm very excited to have you on. And before we begin, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Tamney. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to join you. And my goodness, that was quite the introduction. I, uh, <laughs> I'm beginning to well up just, uh, just listening to it, but I, I certainly appreciate it. And to, to echo your sentiment as well, I'd like to wish uh, my dad, Jeff, who's living in the UK, um, I'm in California, uh, a very happy Father's Day, uh, and to all the dads out there as well. Um, as you mentioned, though, who, who am I? So uh, my name is Rob Sims, and my career began when I was about halfway through a university college degree and I realized that I was doing a course that I just wasn't really that passionate in so I, I, I made a brave decision and I left the degree halfway through to begin a career as a radio broadcaster. I uh, found myself working with uh, the BBC and some UK commercial stations which included me providing live traffic and travel uh, bulletins and updates 
um, in the week. And then at the weekends, I would actually provide live commentating uh, and reporting for football matches, soccer games uh, in the UK. And after spending a number of years sort of as a journalist, if you like, as a radio reporter, um, I came to realize that I really enjoyed talking a lot. Uh, and I'm, it's not a skill, but I just enjoy meeting people and I just enjoy talking and everybody's got a great story. So I kind of honed in on this skill set, if you like, uh, and moved into the world of uh, advertising. And I ended up getting a job selling sponsorship at an event company uh, based in the UK. Uh, and then through that organization, I actually moved into event management um, because they, they ran um, some conferences around the world. And that really sort of ignited my career within the event space and the, the conference industry. Um, it's provided me with a, a great opportunity to travel around the world and, and really meet some incredible people. Um, after a number of years, uh, I actually partnered up with a former colleague of mine and we started our own conference company uh, which is where i was lucky enough to meet you tamne uh, in toronto all those years ago yeah. uh, where you were a keynote speaker and uh, and then that sort of has taken me through to today where i now as you mentioned run a uh, customer advisory boards for google cloud and what that means is essentially over the last 18 months while i've been at google cloud um, i am running and managing boardroom style in-person meetings for customers to engage and provide feedback and technology direction on Google Cloud strategy. So that's a, uh, a very high level overview of, uh, of who I am and, and a little bit of information about my background. And to think that all of that started with that one brave decision to, to drop out of your, uh, your college that one, the, 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 those many years ago. That's, that's really fascinating to hear about. Thank you for, for sharing your story, Rob. And I mean, I know you have all sorts of experience within this, this space of conferences and even just generally human interaction, right? And, and, and sort of enabling that human interaction to take place in a certain structure that makes it effective. Um, and there's, there's so much to, to unpack here. And so what I want to start off with is actually going into the past a little bit. And what I mean by that is I want to take a look at, you know, before this whole COVID scenario, before the coronavirus struck, when we used to hold these large scale in-person conferences and meetups and events. Can you give me some examples of how technology was leveraged in these large scale conferences? that we don't really realize. And, and just really quickly, for a little bit of um, backstory as to why I'm asking this, I feel like in a lot of different sort of scenarios, we take for granted the kind of impact that technology has on our lives. And I feel like realizing that impact can help us use the technology more effectively. So where exactly have we been leveraging technology within this conferences area, enabling us to hold these large person events, large scale events? Um, and, and how has that been, how has that been instrumental? Yeah, so I've, I've seen a lot of change uh, in a very short space of time as technology has become more of an enabler at conferences. Again, talking about post COVID. Um, I, a couple of my first uh, conferences, which I attended, had uh, printed out handheld agendas. Um, that's almost obsolete now, where the idea came to build conference apps, where you can choose which sessions you want to be part of. And then through the technology in your mobile phone, all of a sudden, everything was, was, was you know, in, in your hand. So from a conference organization perspective, it was great because you can make real live updates to any agenda changes. If there's a change in speaker or you need to upload a presentation, you can do that in real time uh, using the technology, which you couldn't do before if there had been a change in speaker on a printed out agenda. Because those things tend to kind of take about three weeks to print. So um, that, that, that's definitely one element that I've seen. And then through, through the apps, uh, you can, while you're in the conference, obviously message the other uh, attendees, which is a great feature. So you may see that Tamne is speaking at an event later on, and I wouldn't necessarily get to speak to you if you're participating in a 5,000 person organization, but I can message you. So I can message you through the app. So that's definitely a, a huge shift um, uh, in terms of the uh, attendee experience. The other elements, of course, from a technology perspective is how presentations are consumed 
while you're at the conference. So, of course, you've got these large uh, audio visual screens that are showing and, and projecting the presentations. Um, but then, of course, you have the ability to live stream a conference onto a platform uh, such as YouTube. And anyone in the world can log in uh, if that conference is being live streamed mm -hmm. so that they can then consume that uh that content and 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 sort of be in the room if, if if that makes sense. So so I think that there are definitely two elements that I think that technology has has sort of helped with an experience of being at a conference. Interesting. And I feel like there are lots of, I mean, as you mentioned, there's all, all these different applications of complex technology, all the way from being able to message attendees to being able to push agenda changes in real time. And these are all things that use all sorts of technology in the back end that we don't really realize every day when we're just at an event. We take that for granted today, but we don't realize that just a couple of years ago we'd have printed out agendas and we have to walk up to speakers in person to be able to talk to them or even other attendees. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see how the event world has changed in person, but then everything you know completely turned around on its head uh, around mid-March when the world started to, to really shelter in place, right? And I want to hear from your um, from your expertise and so from your experience uh, actually you know, managing these events and, and working within this in this industry. What exactly has changed within this world? So how exactly have conferences shifted from going you know physical large scale to now having virtual events? Have, have things like the scale events changed? Have you know the different topics that are being discussed changed? You know, what what has changed from that those physical conferences to now these virtual events that we're holding? Yeah, so I think you know first and foremost, twenty twenty is going to go down as a year where everybody has had to adapt instantly, really quickly. Businesses have changed, uh, human behavior has changed. I think, you know, the event side at the, or the event aspect put aside, I, I, I truly believe that as a human race, we are building up tremendous resiliency. And I'm convinced that there's gonna be a load of studies on human behavior just from 2020 alone. Um, but regarding the business, you know, to your point, there has been huge shifts in a lot of areas. Uh, one in particular on how organizations are having to adapt to allowing entire workforces um, to be at home uh, and still perform uh, their day-to-day -day job. But specifically looking at conferences, everything changed. Um, and, and, and again, kind of looking at technology, it has been a real enabler because people can now attend a conference that, you, that may have just been difficult to get to, right? Yeah. So they could, you, you could be based in London, uh, there's a conference in Hong Kong, um, but you don't have the time to travel to Hong Kong. You can now attend that conference. Mm -hmm. um, the burden of asking a European speaker to travel to the West Coast of America to come and speak at an event has been removed. Um, and technology has enabled some events to still operate very successfully to be able to share the content with wider audiences and have that kind of far reach. But you do miss... You know, that's all very well, but I think the one element which you cannot easily replicate is building in-person relationships. So it's things like the networking lunches or uh, executive dinners um, or even just the coffee breaks, right? And having that conversation with a peer of yours or another attendee whilst grabbing some food. I mean, all of that goes out the window when you pivot to digital. Mm -hmm. um, time zones are obviously a bit of a problem as well. Uh, so if you kind of think about it, when everybody's flying into a destination, you're jet lagged, but you're still all on the same time zone. So while I said, you know, you can be in London and, and virtually attend an event in Hong Kong, um, you still have to be very cognizant of the time zones. Um, so if it's a six hour event, for example, uh, and you're based in New York and, and you know, the, the event is taking place in Bangkok, it's going to be really difficult to attend. Um, and I think also concentration levels, <clears throat> excuse me, concentration levels dip via video. Uh, that's definitely another problem. Not only do you lose interaction within the session room, you actually lose, you just get distracted on video. It's exhausting. You're constantly not only having to think about what the content is being presented to you, but you also have to you know, be watching everything as well. It's, 
it's exhausting. So I think while technology absolutely enables uh, events to still run, there are pros and cons to it as well, for sure. And I think once those restrictions lift, um, I just believe that the confidence in a thousand people being in confined spaces has really been impacted, right? How yeah. comfortable are people going to be flying, staying in a hotel, shaking hands? You know, it, it seems it seems crazy that we three months ago we were shaking a stranger's hand, and now you wouldn't you wouldn't go within two meters of anyone. I mean, I, I'll turn the question to you, Tamley, because you know you've keynoted at hundreds of events and attended probably thousands in in your uh, in in your time. Um, what's your mindset? Would you are you comfortable being in in a confined hotel with? hundreds of people <laughs> so i mean again I, I would say it really depends right there's no clear-cut answer to this it depends on the region it depends on the time it depends on the situation of of, of the virus of the time in that region it depends on all sorts of things um, in general, I would say that the majority of people, including myself, wouldn't necessarily be comfortable going to a large scale, you know, many thousands of people event, at least today. And that's where technology comes in, right? Because as you mentioned, there's that little, there's that in-person element that you just lack with technology. Things like having to concentrate on video, which is fundamentally distracting, right? And, and this is also where we have the chance to integrate next generation technologies, I feel. Uh, if you take a look, um, Apple has their iPad Pro, and one of the most common issues, this is what people really don't like about it, is when you have the iPad Pro in landscape, the camera's on the left. So when you're looking at the screen, it looks like you're looking at a totally <laughs> different world. <laughs> but yeah. what's amazing is that with the power of machine learning within FaceTime, Apple's able to actually correct your eye direction and calibrate it to the center of the screen. So it looks as if you're looking directly at the camera. And so there's some really amazing applications of technology here that enable us to really stop having to focus on the fact that we're using technology for events but still use them and get sort of like the best of both worlds. Of course, there's always going to be, in my opinion at least, that little element of human interaction that you can't really replicate with technology, as you mentioned. But technologies like AR and VR and AI are going to help us close that gap as far as we can get it to be. Some people may even prefer that. Like, I mean, one thing I would say, for example, is that um, since this whole sort of lockdown started and since we've had to you do all these events virtually, the barrier of entry to even holding an event has also gotten a lot lower. And that means more and more people are holding events, which is in a way a, 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 um, a double-edged sword in the sense that you have a lot more events and sometimes it becomes harder to find the higher quality ones. But at the same time, that means that if you have great ideas and if you have a group of people that want to share their thoughts, it's easier than ever to get your message out with the power of technology, right? Before you would have to, you know, spend hundreds, thousands of dollars actually arranging for the event to happen in person, but now you can just host it online for essentially free, right? I mean, on YouTube you can live stream with just your computer and a webcam today. You can share your screen, you can do whatever you need to do. And so this is enabling a whole new dimension of people creating content, people consuming content, and even just that bridge between creating and consuming is also powered by AI, right? Being able to recommend, for example, who wants to watch tech life skills versus who wants to watch Tanmay's live coding series. You know, who, who would be interested in that? You two can use machine learning to figure out, hey, because of your demographic, I think you're a developer. Maybe you're interested in this series. Oh, maybe you, uh, someone who's an executive at a certain company, maybe you're interested in this series. You know, it, 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 all of this being powered by next generation technologies enables virtual events to happen, in my opinion. And so I, 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 I agree. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's it, you have to sorry to uh, interrupt, but I, I no think worries. what is also worth calling out is that the platform that you're using to, to watch or, you know, participate in in sessions, it has to not only be secure, but it needs to be reliable and easy to use as well. Um, you also have to think about Wi-Fi connections in in people's homes. Um, there's a lot of burden being placed on home Wi-Fi systems, right? Children are streaming and downloading videos, playing online computer games while their parents have to take video conference calls or, you know, live stream uh, events. And I think that puts a huge demand on bandwidth. 
um, to your point as well. Um, and and the, the whole element of, of the security around your data is also something to, uh, to call out as well. And I feel like uh, what you actually just mentioned there is a really interesting point, because just as technology, and also just side note, speaking of machine learning technology, I mean, it's not perfect, we all know that. <laughs> um, as I was speaking, one of my devices, uh, Apple devices, uh, miss, uh, did not recognize what I was saying and thought I was saying the, the wake word for Siri and, and activated. So machine learning is not perfect, but it's helping <laughs> us in so many ways. Um, and, and so, yeah, getting back to my point though, just as technology makes all these sorts of events more accessible to so many people, in a way, it also makes it less accessible to so many people. Whereas before, you could drive over to a conference center or you could fly out to a different country. Now, if you live in a part of a country that doesn't have reliable access to the internet or, or something of that sort, you're kind of locked away from the rest of the world, right? You, you can no longer access events. You can no longer do this sort of thing. Um, and, and this ties into all sorts of uh, all sorts of different fields. Events, conferences would be one of them. Education is definitely one of them. This is a major point that we discussed uh, on a separate episode with um, uh, with a bunch of leaders in the field of education a couple of weeks ago. And so speaking of this sort of shift from, from physical to virtual and how it's becoming more accessible, less accessible, and how we're using next generation technologies to facilitate that transition, I wanted to sort of get your thoughts on how we are using technology to really change the mindset of people in the sense of how we think of human interaction. Right? How have we redefined what it means to socialize even? How, how have we changed that mindset of people with the power of technology in this era? Yeah, so I think uh, it sort of comes back to the ability, to your point, uh, to not have to kind of travel, right? You're, uh, many people's commute time has been chopped down to 30 seconds from their bedroom to the, to the okay. office. And uh, uh, th th that's huge, right? So people are able to, to, to be online for longer periods in the day, particularly if they're not having to drive. Um, they also don't have the distractions of being on public transport uh, and also, you know, the Wi-Fi connectivity. Yeah, it is a problem for, for some uh, people in more rural areas. Absolutely. Um, but I also think it is getting a little better as well. Right. So um, technology has uh, really enabled people to to be more connected because everyone's using Zoom or everybody's using Google Hangouts or Meets. Um, there are some, uh, you know, really cool features that, that that make it quite fun. You can change the background um, and, and and almost be anywhere in the world or in space, right? You can have like the moon surface uh, in the background if you wish to. And it just kind of makes things a little fun. Um, the other great thing about, you know, being digital is that you can, you can just share so much more, right? You can share so much more content. You can upload presentations. Uh, you can add in other people to the conversations. Um, uh, companies are still being able to very much function. Uh, decisions and, and questions and answers are, are, are being made faster. Um, and, and I think people are still able to get even more of the content that they want to receive um, through everything moving to digital. So, yeah, I think it's a, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting um, mindset. The one danger that, that that I am seeing is something called event fatigue. Um, you touched upon it yourself. There's so many events uh, in the world anyway, and there are some that you can naturally say, I can't make the date of that one because I have to travel to Paris or I can't be at this event because it, you know, it clashes with a, a, a boardroom. Um, but that all gets removed with not only the shelter in place, but also the digital aspect because you don't need to travel anymore. So there is a danger of this, this phenomenon called event fatigue where everybody is trying to uh, shift their conferences and meetings to a digital environment. And it's very difficult to differentiate the value as the audience will receive from being um, uh, present at these, at these events. So the audience has a has more decisions that they need to make when they're looking at the content of a conference and who's speaking at that event to choose if they actually uh, want to go to it rather than 
well, I'm in New York this week, so I can actually go to that conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Event fatigue is definitely something to keep in mind. And you're right, because because there's that lower level of um, there, there's that lower barrier to both holding and going to conferences. That means there are more conferences and less excuses to not go to conferences, <laughs> <laughs> which results in, in a lot more work, um, which, you know, is is in, in a way a very good thing. There's a lot more content being produced. There's more messages getting across. But at the same time, we don't want to overdo that. And so it's, it, you're right, it's, it is absolutely critical to, keep, to be mindful of that amount of work um, that, that you've got to take up during that, um, during that period of time. I mean, you mentioned all these sorts of features like being able to, even on Zoom as we're using right now, being able to choose like a virtual background, which I just did and, and you know, demonstrated, which is really incredible because previously you'd have to have a green screen like this one in order to, and you'd have to have like perfect lighting and you would need to do all these sorts of things to have a virtual background but now you can just click a button and like that on your processor in real time uh, your video is being separated segmented your body versus the background without having to have two cameras no depth involved nothing it's just happening automatically uh, it, it's, it's pretty incredible technology and once again that technology is enabling us to do things at home that previously required all sorts of professional equipment you, you, you're absolutely right. And not, I'm not here to push Google products, but I will call it out and mention um, Google have, have uh, released via uh, Google Meets, which is uh, uh, their video conference platforming, um, an audio noise cancelling feature. Yes. So if you're working from home and your children are watching Paw Patrol or uh, there's a lot of noise in the background, you click the button and the machine learning um, and, uh, and the AI feature uh, cuts in and it picks up your voice and your voice only. And you can literally be sat here tapping a bottle. I mean, you can hear me doing that. And um, with the feature on Google, you can do that and you will not hear me tapping the bottle. You'll just hear me speaking. It's incredible. They've also got this uh, fantastic feature around closed captioning. Um, so you just, again, click the button. And if you're speaking with somebody that maybe has a strong accent or, you know, if, 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 um, if, if the language uh, that is being presented in is not your first language and, and you find it quite difficult to understand, you hit the closed captioning and it's almost verbatim uh, and the speed is incredible with the closed captioning subtitles coming up as people are speaking. It, it's, it's a, a wonderful uh, feature that, that, that is really helping people uh, in this kind of strange norm that we're now living in. That is truly incredible. And I mean, no, that what you mentioned around this Google Meet, that's actually a prime example of how we're using this technology in order to enable um, really human interaction to happen in a time like this one. Uh, I feel like, I mean, noise canceling, what you mentioned, that's powered by what people don't realize, very cutting edge machine learning technology. That is like, fresh out of research. This is brand new stuff that is being applied in the real world that instantly. This is almost unheard of, the rate of innovation that, that COVID has forced us to enter into. Um, and, you know, noise cancellation, being able to remove the tapping of the bottle, you know, the crinkling of the Tim Tam bag, whatever, that, that's really <laughs> incredible. Uh, closed captioning, specifically the translation. That is amazing because now you could be joining into an event and, and you can have a speaker going on, on YouTube Live and instead of there having to be people that are actually translating in real time, you can now have machine learning technology automatically generating closed captioning in hundreds of different languages instead of just the languages of the region in which you are presenting or you're holding the event. And so there are so many possibilities um, that are opened up thanks to this. And so my question for you here is, again, we've talked about all this technology, we've talked about closed captioning, we've talked about you know, these virtual backgrounds, we've talked about noise cancelling, and, and there's all these little pieces of technology scattered around enabling us to interact in a time like this one. So based off of all this technology, what do you think the future of events looks like? So what do you think an event maybe a year or two in the future, even in the far future, what do you think that's going to look like? And how do you think the interaction in those events is going to work? And, and what kind of role will technology play? Will we see more of a role? Will we see less of a role in the sense that we're going to go back to person-to-person -to -person interaction? What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so <laughs> that's a really tough question because I don't think anyone really has the definite answer. Um, my personal opinion is I think it'll be a hybrid of both. So I think you will have the in-person meetings and those sessions will come back. Um, they'll probably be smaller and then there will be lots of care and effort sort of put into not only the sanitization, but also I think buffets are a thing of the past, right? I, have, I don't think you'll ever see those kind of grand buffets that you see at these conferences anymore, which is a shame because they're excellent. Um, but, you know, I think you'll have the in-person meetings. They'll probably be shorter. So instead of them being a multi-day session, it'll be maybe half a day or, or a full day with then various touch points of um, digital interactions as well. So I think there's a real opportunity for conference organizers um, to have this kind of hybrid, introduce technology um, and build really a very high scale, high touch point, digital interactive sessions with their audience. And I've seen some, some pretty cool things that have been done at, at, at different parts of um, of, of, of Google, actually, uh, you know, things like virtual dinners. So ahead of the the event, the day before, um, all of the attendees will be sent a dinner uh, that they can then heat up in preparation for, um, for, for, for the meeting, either the next day or later on in that day. And the setup's great, right? So you've got this, uh, you've got all these people, I've, I've seen it with 20 people, all on this kind of grid view, um, sent, you know, candelabra and they light the candles and they're sat down and they're having dinner and discussing topics as you would do uh, in that sort of executive boardroom style dinner setting. Um, and it's worked really, really well. Again, time zone is something that, that comes into play here. Um, and of course, the inability to have that sort of human connection. But it's, it's, it's all about making the best possible situation out of the situation that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very, uh, very key to, 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 to understand that this isn't a situation where people are working from home. People are having to shelter in place and as a result, having to work from their home. And that, and that in itself is something to, to understand. The, the, the way that we've had to adapt and adopt technology use some people may not have had the training to, to go straight into digital, right? Which is why these platforms, from a user experience perspective, have to be really uh, uh, clean and simple to use mm -hmm. so that you're still able to, to carry out this function. So the future of events, I think, will, you know, I, I, I personally, I miss people. I miss meeting people. I obviously have my family around me. They're probably sick and tired of me being around and, <laughs> and talking so much, but I, but I miss meeting people. It comes back to, I think what I said at the very beginning of, 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 of our meeting here of, you know, everybody has a great story to, to tell and, and they don't tell it over digital. Um, you, it, it's difficult to build a relationship with somebody um, that you would normally have a, you know, find common ground with at a conference, you know, in those sort of breakout sessions, you just, it's very difficult to do it here. So I hope we go back to in-person meetings, but I think there's definitely a play to have these sort of virtual round tables and, and digital interactions as well, because now this thing has impacted everybody across the world. This is the new norm. The new norm is I'm gonna open up my device and I'm gonna take a video conference call. That's what we all do now. So everybody's mindset has shifted and they are willing to be on video. It's very rare now that people are even calling into video platforms, right? That everybody is on video. I can't even remember the last time I received the phone call. It's all <laughs> video. Um, yeah. So I think, I don't think that will go away. And, and, and I think that's great because again, you can have this in-person meeting where everybody flies in and then you can maybe have breakout regional digital get togethers, right? So you're placing people in Canada with people in Canada and people from Europe with people in Europe on the same time zone and then presenting content, which is probably relevant to those different regions. Um, yeah, so I think that that's my personal take on it. I believe it'll be uh, a hybrid of both, but I really also hope, I'm so passionate about events and conferences and meeting 
people. Um, I really hope we we get back to some form of uh, of in person meetings as well. As with so many things, usually hybrids end up to be the best approach, right? Getting the best of both worlds, because yeah. there are some really good things about today's virtual events, the fact that it's so accessible, but then there are some really good things about in-person events, you know, that interaction that you get with people. And what you mentioned around um, in, in a time like this one, being able to just send people meals and having these virtual dinners. I mean, um, the, this was actually something that uh, my team at, at IBM actually did a little while ago, where they would actually send out, you know, meals, whatever they wanted to the, to the different folks on the team because of course they couldn't get together and actually have a team lunch um, and and then that way they would um, they would have a, a, a virtual team lunch and it was it was it was it was a really um, sort of exciting way to do something that we used to do but now virtually right and, and, and through this sort of um, through this virtual sort of interface and I mean as I mentioned before technology is really the enabler making that possible. We were talking about translations. I mean, I remember um, back when I was keynoting in like um, the, the the UAE or, or in Mexico or wherever, of course, I can't learn all those different languages. And so I would be... Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, not, invent, not until we invent machine learning to teach our <laughs> languages more effectively. Uh, but... But so, so what I would do is, of course, I would be speaking in English, and there would be humans painstakingly listening to everything in real time, you know, that super stressful job, listening to what I'm speaking and translating that. And then plus, I like to, you know, usually in, in some cases speak faster because, you know, limited time, a lot of content I want to get across, I speak fast, and that messes then up, and so I have to speak slower, and it's, it's just not a great user experience. It's a stressful job, uh, and it's a, it's a job that machines can and should do better. Um, and so so there's, there's all sorts of ways that then from there on out, humans and machines can collaborate on these sorts of tasks and enable a better user experience for everybody involved. Instead of three languages, we can have 140 with Google, right? We can have all these sorts of luxuries that we couldn't have with just pure human um, intelligence and interaction. Now, I am going to take a quick break here, just so you know, uh, everybody on the live stream, uh, if you do have any questions for us, feel free to put that in the live chat. We would love to get to those. I already see there are a couple. Uh, I will be answering them in just a moment. Uh, we'll be getting to that. Uh, but first, though, Rob, I do want to ask you a question with two parts. The first one's not going to be as serious. The second one is going to be a little bit more serious. So my first question for you is, if you could just magically invent any technology to have the perfect event, what would that technology be? <clears throat> oh my goodness. Uh, that's a great question. I think, <laughs> I think firstly, I'll invent a time machine and go back to October 2019 <laughs> um, before this pandemic hit, right? Uh, no, joking aside. Um, I think, you know, what, what, I'm, what I really like actually is the idea of um, <clears throat> hologram and the telepresence technology. So um, this exists today in a capacity, but I think the magic wand that you've given me, I'd like to maybe enhance that technology for both audiences and presenters mm -hmm. so that you can feel like you're truly at a digital event. So, you know, this could then maybe, I don't know, give you the ability to go back to an event that's already happened I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if it felt like you were at the iPhone launch uh, and Steve yeah. Jobs was giving you that keynote? That'd be great. Or perhaps at a sports match, you know, at the um, uh, a, a boxing match with Muhammad Ali, right? And you were in the crowd and it felt like, you know, that would be, that would be amazing. But I think some kind of maybe hologram uh, telepresence technology, which... Oh, Rob, you seem to have cut out. I'm there we back. go. You're back. You are. Back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we, we spoke about the burden of home Wi-Fi's, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> did you get, did you, did you get my answer? Did I, uh, where did, where did, no, you, where did you, I get cut off? You, you cut out uh, a couple of seconds ago. I would say like 20 seconds ago, 10 seconds ago, but you got until around, um, I'm forgetting where you were now, but if you could just speak that, that the, sec the, the holograms and the... Yes, yeah, yes. I think, you know, the, the, the technology that exists around <clears throat> holograms and telepresence is great. I'd love to see that up-leveled so that you could then go to, you know, either events that have already happened or, 
or be at events, you know, or 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 as a presenter, be on stage in front of you know all, all these uh, all, all these great folks. So that would be where I would wave. Uh, your magic one that you give me. <laughs> uh, what a, what a what a wonderful demonstration! You know, your your wife I really helped us out here to demonstrate you know some of the problems that we face with virtual the challenges. <laughs> these aren't real. I'm not making this up, Tamu. <laughs> yeah, yep. That I could tell that was real. But um, yeah, I, I can't wait to to get back to the tech time with Tanmay series or holding it in person because then we won't have real time lag <laughs> but uh, but anyway back to back to what i was saying uh, the reason that i asked you this question is because i personally feel like um, within the field of technology the most effective way to build the most effective way to solve real problems is not to just have a bunch of technologists you know sitting at a desk working in programming and and working on tech and not at the same time to just have a bunch of um, you know, subject matter experts that are like, hey, we can use AI here, or we can use this other technology here. Rather, if the two of those groups work together in a really close fashion, that's when we really innovate. That's when we really solve problems. And so that's why I ask you this question, because I feel like you as a subject matter expert within this sort of conferences space, uh, if, if we can understand the problems that you face with events, whether they're large scale in person events or even virtual events, if we understand those problems, then technologists can actually go in and figure out what technologies to use to solve those problems. So you mentioned a, one of this, a, a solution to this sort of in-person interaction could be you know, holograms and augmented reality in a way, basically. You know, who knows, maybe by 2023 we would, uh, we're, we're going to have some, some glasses that can help us out with that. Um, but but, but I, I wanted to sort of generalize a little bit further. Do you have any sort of specific problems that you would usually or, or, or just generally face as an organizer of an event or as someone who's planning things out that you think we can invent technology to solve? What are those problems? Yeah, so uh, one key problem would be the attendees and making sure people turn up. That's okay. definitely every event organizer's fear. Uh, you never know how successful an event is going to be until registration opens, mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 even the 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 registration component itself. Um, you know, you it, it can take a while if it's a large event and the doors open and everybody's you know walking through at the same time, and it's a five thousand person uh, session. It takes a long time to get five thousand people through the doors. So outside of like having humans behind desks i'd love to see i mean i know some pr like printing technology exists for name badges um and you know you still need to check people in but i just wonder if there are um sort of some some aspects of technology to make that problem go away uh, a little bit uh, faster certainly certainly the attendees piece um Wi-Fi is always an issue. I mean, it just happened to me. But, you know, again, if you've got, I mean, I've been at conferences that have had 30,000 people. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of the time you are in a, a large hotel or, or conference space. That's a lot of people who are walking around with maybe two devices. There's, you know, their mobile device and their laptop. So if it's a 30,000 30, person organization, that's potentially 60,000 um, devices which are uh, trying to get online and check emails and, and all that kind of stuff. So that, they're, they're definitely bandwidth and Wi-Fi technology and also um, the, uh, the attendee piece from a registration perspective. That's absolutely something where I believe technology can help. I mean, airlines have been doing it for years, overbooking their, their flights and, and using complex statistics and machine learning technology to predict who's going to show up, who's not going to show up, and occasionally it backfires, uh, like, <laughs> like when you have a, a flight and they start paying people to get off the flight. But, yeah. you know, in, in the majority of cases, which is what airlines care about, it works. It predicts when people aren't going to show up and people still get their seats. Uh, and the airline doesn't send planes with like 
with, with a half empty um, cabin. And so absolutely, technology can, can help here and I feel like it's going to have a huge impact. And I'm also going to start streaming in some questions from the live stream because I feel like there are quite a few so I do want to get to those. And I actually want to start off with a question from Timothy Duncan. Uh, there, 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 are two, there are two questions. I want to start off with one. The question is, uh, so with virtual events, we've seen all sorts of like different cool ways of, of holding virtual events, and a lot of these virtual events, the vast majority, uh, are free to attend. Unlike physical events, which of course aren't because they're expensive to hold. So do you feel like that's the new model? Will consumers feel like physical events are enough of a value add to pay physical event fees? And uh, actually to add upon that, Another thing to think about is that when you're holding a very large scale physical event, you know, it, just the scale of it kicks in and enables you to charge less from each person. But then, if enough people are joining virtually that only very few people feel the need to actually pay the in-person premium, do you feel like that premium will increase? What do you think the future is around the value of in-person conferences? Are they as yeah. useful now as they were before? Yeah, so um, it's it's a it's a great question, and 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 you know one which is it's truly impacting some conference uh, organisers for sure because it's essentially hitting their their bottom line. However, I think what's worth calling out uh, as well from from why do people pay a registration fee to attend an event is because it's normally offsetting the cost to put the conference on. So if you think about Again, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the 10,000 person um, um, uh, event. To get a venue and put on the type of conference build out, the audio visual, the food and beverage, um, the staffing, you know, hours that you need to pay for, they cost a lot. So certainly when you're, when you're buying a ticket to attend a physical event, it's normally to offset those kind of costs. Um, from a you know from a sponsorship perspective i don't think that will change dramatically because if you're running a tech event and tech solution providers still want to get their name out there they will still sponsor digital boardrooms or digital events that's um that's that's that probably won't go away um and again it comes back down to the content so you know who who is speaking and what are they speaking about if you've got a former president of the United States that's going to be presenting in a digital meeting, I think he is still going to probably charge. Therefore, you will need to offset some of the cost. Um, how do you go about it? Again, maybe that comes back to the technology of, you know, is there a way to enter credit card details or a prepayment to attend an event uh, that is virtual? That's something I've not explored, um, but, but certainly that's an, a way that technology can help. Um, you know, enable uh, people to to make prepayments uh, to attend a, a virtual event. Maybe once you make the payment, you get the code. But then what stops, uh, it would have to be unique code that only works on one device because what would stop one person paying for the ticket and then sending it to five or six of her friends, right? So, um, uh, the, the, you know, it throws up all kinds of challenges for sure. I think the... The ability, though, to be able to run free events or, or free events to attend um, is, is great because, again, you've removed the whole question about, well, do I have the budget to attend this type of, of conference? And that can be a prohibiting factor for sure. Great question. And I feel like specifically what you mentioned around being able to use technology to be able to, to facilitate those transactions and payments, you're right, that is a way to do it. And I feel like um, technology enables a sort of tiering that in-person events didn't enable before. So for example, you can unlock extra functionality at a certain event by paying, or you can join the sessions for free. You know, I mean, uh, f for example, uh, this is just completely hypothetical, um, you could have an in-person event with advertisements, and the, 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 um, the conference could be paid by those advertisements, just like mm. creators on YouTube are being paid by the ads on their videos. 
Uh, and so I feel like that's definitely one way to do it, and then we could have attendees that actually pay if they want to support the event, kind of like with open source software, uh, and, then, and, and then sort of enable the maintenance of the event or even pay for certain features. Uh, and so that is definitely something that, 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 that can be looked into in terms of a, a way to, to hold these events. And again, technology is that facilitator enabling that to happen um, virtually. And so I do know that you mentioned the, uh, the holograms. In fact, Tim actually put another comment in the live chat, uh, and he mentioned, I've experienced some cool virtual conference platforms like Hop In. Have you heard of Hop In? Yeah, I have. Yeah, the great. Interesting. I have yeah. not heard of it, unfortunately. I will take a look at it. And uh, Tim's question originally was, I wish some of their features were in the YouTube platform. Do you know of any plans to enhance YouTube with more features? <laughs> Oh, there's always plans. There's always plans. Um, it's it's a part of the organisation. Actually, I'm I'm quite far removed from uh, from from YouTube. I mean, we're all part of the same organisation, being Alphabet. Um, and I do have some friends that that work within YouTube, but um, my day job is quite far removed from from YouTube. So I would I would point you into uh, and and sorry, Tim, to do this, but. Uh, because I don't have the answer, but I would I would absolutely point you to um, some of the, perhaps the forums on YouTube where you can ask an administrator um, uh, some of these some of these features, or, or even connect with me after this. I'm I'm happy to make an introduction. That would be wonderful. We'll get to that in just a moment. Yeah. Uh, but another thing that I did want to ask you, and this is another question from the live chat from Daniel, Daniel Slade. He asks, this is going to have a huge impact on networking, especially when some of the best networking has come, uh, can come from spontaneous conversations. Do you feel that technology advancement will create less genuine interaction? I mean, this is the the million dollar question um and 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 it's a, it's such a good one because i'm so again i'm so passionate uh, daniel about meeting people in person and 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 being being rob sims to people right and because people on people form uh, relationships and friendships and and partnerships through people it's an old sales saying that people buy from people um and you know, you can have a conversation with somebody over a cup of tea or a coffee or, or dinner. And you're like, you know what, I really like that person, I'm going to stay in contact with them. And it, it's so difficult to get the same. Um, uh, in, again, I, I keep using the word interaction, but I guess that that is the only that that is the best term for it. It's really difficult to do it digitally. I think where technology could help and thinking about my kind of magic wand wish uh, would be potentially if both people have the kind of hologram um, sort of that that sort of telepresence machine in their home and it felt like that person was in the room, then maybe, maybe, just maybe you can go back to to, to how it was when you meet, you know, when you meet those people at, at conferences. I don't know. I feel like there are a couple ways to look at it. I mean, what you mentioned is is definitely completely valid in the sense that it's very difficult to replicate genuine human interaction um, virtually. But the question around will technology advancement lead to less genuine human interaction, I feel like another way to look at that, and this is, a, again, a, I, I, I'm going back to a quote from a couple episodes ago from Dr. Shafi Ahmed, who was on the show. Um, he mentioned in one of his quotes was that when we use technology like artificial intelligence, we are making ourselves more human in the sense that we are doing things that define us as humans and not necessarily things that we have to do to keep society structured the way we keep it. Um, so, like, for example, when we're applying artificial intelligence for translation, what we're doing is we are taking a task that didn't really require the human capabilities to a certain extent that we've evolved to have, we're offloading that to technology so we can do things that are more relevant to us. And so in general, I would say on a much larger scale, not even just for specific conferences or generally, on a larger scale, technology advancement will lead to more genuine human intera interaction. 
But on that smaller scale, when we look at certain conferences, when we look at person-to-person -person interaction, that's where I think we need to apply um, a lot more thought to see how that can be taken forward with technology in a time like this one. Which actually uh, brings me to another question. We've, we've mentioned that in the future, you know, we want to have these sort of hybrid events. Do you believe that in the future there will be events, you know, large scale events like the ones we used to hold uh, pre COVID times? And if so, <clears throat> is there going to be a specific technology that enables that to happen? Or do you think those are a thing of the past? We're going to be holding more close knit conferences. Tim, for example, actually put in the live chat that we are going to be uh, holding more close knit conferences because if we wanted these large scale conferences, you know, we can do them virtually now. So, so do you think there's a place for that now? And if so, what kind of technologies are we going to be using to enable that? Yeah, so I, I so I, I think events are, are really important. Um, organizations still need to market products. Uh, organizations need to get messages to vast audiences. Um, but there has been a shift for sure. You know, events are in, in the digital environment, they're shorter. Um, but that gives you the opportunity to be more targeted with the messaging. Um, and I think I mentioned as well for you to actually have regionalized sessions as well. So if you have a product launch, if you're a company that's launching a global product, but there are different aspects to the different regions that you're launching to, for example, you know, EMEA, uh, there might be some special customers that you want to call out that are only known perhaps in Germany or, or the UK and, and likewise in the US uh, as well. You may have a case study that you'd want to talk about from a uh, well-known American brand that potentially isn't a global brand or, or perhaps not as well-known outside of the US. So, it, you know, it, it's, I, I still think conferences are going to exist, but I think there's definitely a shift um, and it'll be higher touch point, more targeted, um, and technology will, will be, will be the, the use of technology in the way that uh, uh, people are able to to log on and view will be the way that conferences not only differentiate themselves from being another digital event, uh, but it's also, um, uh, it, it's, it's just an opportunity, I think, to, to have a bit more diversity as well in bringing different speakers from around the world um, and push that through technology and connect with your audience uh, uh, through, through, through the tech that you're using. I will say again, we were talking about technology, you were audible, but your video froze for a moment. But um, <laughs> again, COVID is forcing us to innovate. We have to bring better internet technology, you know, things like what SpaceX is doing with Starlink. These are important things uh, for a world like this one. Uh, a couple more questions. Another comment from Tim Duncan. Uh, you were asking me a little while ago, what would actually get me to get on a plane in a time like this one? You know, would I be comfortable staying in a hotel room? Mm. Tim mentions I would pay and travel to an event at a Google data center. That would get me to get on a plane. And so, <laughs> <laughs> being able to. So, <laughs> well, you know, it's it's something that we get requested all the time. Like, can oh, yeah. we come in and see a Google data center? I mean, you would not, but oh, you probably would believe. But it is something that we are asked uh, a lot of the time. The reality is um, that the data centers tend to be in very very remote places. I think there are maybe two or three um, that are within fifty miles of a. Uh, of, of a major airport um the rest are just like very remote high secure building that you need um vp and above approval to get access because you know these are these are the 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 lifeblood of the organization the security that wraps itself around uh, google's data centers so um yeah, I, Tim, I'd be right there with you. Uh, if I could get access, I would. <laughs> they're very secure. Um, they're very remote. And, you know, I'm sure if you've ever seen the inside of a data center, I'm not sure how different they'll, 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 they'll all appear. Once you've kind of looked at it for maybe five, ten minutes, you'll think, I've just, tw I've, I've just traveled 12 hours to see a couple of pipes. <laughs> <laughs> However, well, again, I can, you know, I can, there are some resources online where you can look at, um, uh, so Google have, have released a couple of uh, shots from a distance 
of what inside a data center looks like because obviously you can't take photographs um, and share that, but you you absolutely can Google it and, and have a look at what the inside of a data center looks like. <laughs> That's it's really interesting to hear. Uh, we do have another question from Adam Culkin. He says, Rob, what is the key or what is the, the secret sauce of an event, be it technology or otherwise? Uh, and I feel like that actually, just to expand upon that question for you a little bit, another question that I would say is, we have all sorts of virtual events now. And with physical events, it becomes pretty easy to differentiate yourself. You know, like you could have something like IBM Think where you're giving, a, where you have this like huge expo and thousands of sessions. You have something like Google I.O. where you've got, you know, all these different, you know, Google, I mean, it's similar um, ways to differentiate um, from a different organization standpoint. And, and, and with a physical event, that becomes a lot easier. But with a virtual event, how do you differentiate yourself? Everyone's holding a physical event. What differentiates your YouTube live stream from someone else's? What differentiates you know, your, your Zoom webinar from someone else's? What can you do to differentiate yourself, to make it a special experience for your audience, something that, that really drives home an impact? Yeah, so to answer Adam's question, it's it's something that I, you know holds very dear to me. Um, what is the secret source? It's always the customer experience. So if you think about the customer as being either the sponsor of an event or the attendee of an event, um, how is their experience? Because without those two, the event is nothing. Um, you know, are they getting that sort of personal um, attention? You know, you know what it's like, Tamne, when you walk into a five star hotel, right? We've all been lucky enough to stay in a five star hotel. I've I don't know how they did it, but one hotel I walked in into the lobby and they said, hello, Mr. Sims, how are you today? That was all it was. I've no idea how they did it. I think maybe maybe they knew that I was coming. I was checking in at like three in the afternoon and they, they knew that, you know, they looked my profile up on LinkedIn or something. I don't know. <laughs> but the person behind the check-in desk said, hello, Mr. Sims. Welcome to the, you know, to the hotel. I, I won't say which one it was. I'm happy to share it because it was, I don't know how they did it. It was phenomenal. But that made me feel so, like that experience was so mind-blowing for me that I knew instantly I was going to have a great stay at the hotel. And I did. Um, so it, it's the experience that you get from either the conference organizer or the other attendees, for sure. Um, the second part of the question, which I didn't write down, so if you uh, if I don't answer it, please ask it again, sure. is... Um, no, go on. Uh, I've, I've forgotten. I've forgotten it already. I'm, no I'm too passionate. So, about that. No oh, how do you differentiate? How do you differentiate yes, exactly. that experience? Yeah. So you're right. In this world of many, many digital events and many offerings, which are free, and you know you can now attend all these kind of things, it's looking at ways to to differentiate yourself from this other digital um, concept. Right. So again, it all comes down to the content. It is so important on how that content is presented and who is the presenter. That, that doesn't really change it for me. If you think about any event, again, pre-COVID, what are the things that you look at? You look at, does the date work for me? If it doesn't, you can move some stuff around. But really, you're looking at, well, why is this interesting for me? Why should I be at this event? And it's, well, that content looks amazing. And wow, it's spoken by that individual. I definitely need to be there. So that's how you differentiate yourself from another digital event. It's the content and who's talking about it. And again, if we're staying in a digital environment, um, one area that I've seen work really, really well is, is this sort of the, the concept of the digital dinners. So, you know, send, and like understanding, let's say, Tamne, I know that you love butter chicken, right? Yes. Because this is something that you've, we've spoken about before. But can you imagine if you were attending an event and the day before you received a package of, you know, pre sort of cooked meal that you just needed to heat up that included butter chicken, your brand of drink that you liked to drink and a menu with a handwritten note saying, dear Tamne, please enjoy this meal. Put it in the oven at, you know, 350 degrees or whatever it is at 7 p.m. in time for us all to get together at 8 p.m. It's not a difficult thing to do, but done correctly. That is so memorable for you. And you'll be like, wow. And how technology plays a role in that are things, you know, very simple things like, 
understanding somebody's profile that they've maybe submitted a survey, right? So they, you know, Tamne, what is your favorite meal? And you type in my favorite dinner, you know, my favorite meal is butter chicken, enter, right? You've just sent that into, into the unknown. And then the next day you get this food delivery, right? And yeah. I mean, it just works. Um, you all know more about the technology build behind how that just works, but, but, but it's, it's that customer experience you would remember that forever because nobody else would be doing it. And if it's done correctly, that's a game changer. Absolutely. And I feel like you're absolutely right. That That's one of the prime examples of how to differentiate your, your virtual event. And there's so many different things we can do. The idea is to think I have, because it's virtual and because we're using technology, I have all these different keys. Which ones do I leverage to actually make this a memorable experience? It could be the, the, the virtual food. I mean, the, even back when, before all this COVID stuff um, originated, um, I was at a conference in Michigan and their like, number one highlight point was, you know, the reason people come year after year is because they have great food at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was a conference about like big data and AI. Um, and and, and that, was, that was like a, a fun thing to see and they did have good food. And, and being able to replicate something like that as a memorable experience through technology is, is really an incredible thing. Um, but there's so many more things that we can do. So for example, I was hosting the um, IBM Digital Summit um, 2020 uh, uh, just a couple days ago on June 16th. And while I was hosting that event, I took a look at the platform and that platform was really incredible. You know, they had this like virtual airport and the different gates corresponded mm. to different like session tracks and they had all these different things planned out and scheduled and, and laid out in a really innovative way. Mm. Uh, and so I would say it goes all the way from, you know, do you want to build a custom platform? You know, do you want to uh, send your attendees virtually, you know, these, these meals, there, there are all sorts of things that you can do. and really it boils down to how can you leverage technology to its fullest extent is, is how I think it, it, it would be nice to summarize it. Do you think that, that do you think that's a good way to to put it into a sentence? I think it's a great way to put it into a sentence. Um, I, I'd love to get your thoughts really about, you know, you said yourself you hosted this digital IBM meeting. Um, how, are you, how have you shifted? Because you I know having worked with you, you know, for a couple of times that you're one day you're in Thailand, the next day you're in London, the next day you're in, you know, Johannesburg or wherever it might be. I mean, you're, 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 you you live on an aeroplane for, for, for quite some time. How has this impacted you? I'd, I'd, I'd love to, to kind of understand and for you to share your thoughts on that. Sure. I mean, really what I would say is that in a way things have really gotten, uh, I'm not going to use the word busier, I'm going to use the word, uh, things have gotten a lot more fun and a lot more stuff is happening, right? It, things are a lot more, a lot more stuff is happening and, and what I mean by that is again, the barrier of entry to holding an event has really gone a lot lower. More events are happening than ever before. So things like, for example, as, as we were mentioning before, the amount of time to actually commute to a certain destination, you know, actually flying out to... Uh, Malaysia or to India or to whatever it is, the layovers, the airports, all that extra quote unquote wasted time, which objectively is wasted, but really if you look at it, there's a reason why it was wasted, so that you could be there for that in-person interaction. So I'm going to use that very loosely, that term wasted, that time that was wasted is no longer wasted, so that means there's more time to do more events. So what I would say is that we really have to be creative today, right? I've, I've got to be very um, creative in the way that content is delivered because only if content is delivered in a certain way is it really going to have the impact that I want it to have. Um, and, and so like a, a little while ago, I was holding a webinar as, as a Google developer expert on an intro to deep learning concepts. And, you know, in order to get across the concept of how neural networks are able to um, map uh, a, 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 certain a certain vector space, an embedding space, um, while, while, maintaining the, um, while maintaining the shape of that object, I'm forgetting the technical term for it right now, but um, while maintaining the topology, yes, while maintaining the topology of that space, 
um, a, a good example was actually physically having like a coffee mug and an actual donut um, and and just being creative in the way that things are described that things are um, th of how content has gotten across has been really important so I would say that I'm doing more than I was able to before because again there's a lot less um, sort of warm-up work and a lot less cool-down work to be done. You, got, you don't have to fly, you don't need to check into a hotel, you don't need to leave. But at the same time, that work, in order for it to be as impactful as it would have been in person, needs to be done in a very creative way. Mm. Uh, and so technology is enabling that creativity to happen. I mean, imagine if I wasn't able to stream this webcam at like, what is this, 30 frames a second at like 1080p resolution. If I couldn't do that, then we wouldn't be hosting this webinar today. I wouldn't be explaining deep learning concepts virtually. Um, and so I would say that things have certainly shifted. We've had to get a lot more creative, but things are still happening, right? It, has, yeah. it hasn't reached the standstill that you would intuitively have thought that, you know, it would have. Of course, the transition was a little quiet from physical to virtual. Everyone was like figuring out, what do we do now? But then after everyone figured that out, things really started to pick up pace. Mm. And I feel like we're actually doing things faster than we were a little while ago because COVID is forcing us to do things faster at this point. Um, and so I, I would say that things are things are getting things are getting a lot more uh, things are getting pretty fun. <laughs> Good, that's great to hear. I mean, it's you know to, to your point, uh, there was a moment where everyone just you know took stock of what was going on in the world, um, but you know we're able to then. Because of, t I mean, can you imagine if this had happened ten years ago? Not even. No. Um, the events as we know it, the interaction, the way that people are working, I, I, it would have been, you know, obviously there a lot of people have lost their lives and will continue to do so as a result of this. But it would have been from a business perspective, it would have definitely had much more, much more of an impact um, on global economies. Even though the global economy will hurt from this, and I don't want to go down this route, but. You know, it will hurt, but, um, you know, if, if without the technology that we have today, sort of five to ten years ago, this would have been uh, uh, even even more catastrophic. Absolutely. I mean, the technology that we have today is really facilitating our lives in, in a situation yeah. like this one. You know, the fact that we can get groceries delivered virtually, the fact that we can host a webinar like this one, the fact that we can go to, like, you know, whatever it is, you, with the fact that we can watch a SpaceX launch virtually, the fact, the fact that we can do all of this um, is, is, is truly incredible. And so now, Rob, there is a question that I want to ask. Now, as you know, the audience on Tech Life Skills is incredibly diverse. We've got all sorts of folks. We've got students. We've got, you know, potentially people who are managing events. We've got, you know, business leaders. We've got developers. We've got all sorts of people. They're watching right. this event today. And so what is your closing message for today's episode? I think, you know, my closing uh, remarks would be stay with it and stay patient because we are starting to see slow movements towards the world opening up again. Um, and we are seeing the way that technology is being used, helping people continue with their roles and and their lives and and attend events. Um, so my my closing point would be: never stop asking questions. Um, always be open-minded to new ways of working. Uh, together we'll come back stronger. And I hope to see you all at a conference sometime in the near future. That is wonderful. Thank you very much, Rob. Also, another question that I have for you. If anybody has ideas around their events or their conferences and they want to get in touch with you and they want to share them with you or get your feedback or work with you, how can they reach out to you? How can they contact you? Yeah, I, I welcome uh, everybody uh, that wants to reach out to me to do so. Uh, LinkedIn is always a very, uh, very, it's an easier way because there are no uh, firewalls for my email address. So, Search for me on LinkedIn. I'm under Rob Sims. Um, I am on Twitter, but it, you know it's it's somewhat of a personal account, I guess. Um, and then and then, yeah, LinkedIn is 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 the best way to get hold of me. And I'm 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 happy to continue conversations. I'm open to hearing ideas. If anyone's got any, um, I'm not you know the the single source of 
of knowing what works and what doesn't, I'm still learning very much so. Um, so would welcome everybody to get in contact with me. LinkedIn is the best way to do it. Thank you very much, Rob. I really appreciate it. I mean, what a coincidence, right? As, uh, right as I ask you how you can be contacted, there's a question in the chat. How can Rob Sims be contacted? Uh, and so <laughs> great thing that we answered that question. And so thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. I absolutely loved hearing them all the way from, you know, how technology is kind of in a way making technology, making events more accessible, how in a way it's becoming less accessible because, for example, people don't have access to the internet, how technology is having this sort of event fatigue. Uh, how you know even just having to focus on video is something that's that's been stressful I mean the joke used to be that when you're on a zoom or a video call you don't need to wear your pants and uh, last uh, last week's episode with uh, with John Cohn we turned that around a little bit the joke is now that you could be like coding on your desk or you could be soldering something on your <laughs> desk <laughs> without anybody ever knowing that you weren't concentrating on your meeting uh, and so video fatigue is definitely a thing meeting fatigue is definitely a thing you know being mindful of the amount of work that you have in a situation like this one and being able to differentiate your events is important right being able to do things like send your attendees these 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 meals that they can cook and have these virtual dinners and virtual um, virtual meals really enabling networking to happen even in a time like this one and I love your thoughts on you know what kind of technologies can we invent I mean if we had a time machine to go back and, 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 and make sure this pandemic never even happened that would be the best but regardless uh, it's it's amazing to see um, that that you know, hopefully in the future we're going to have things like holograms and augmented reality enabling virtual human interaction um, in, in a way that currently isn't possible. And hopefully in the future we start to see a hybrid of these virtual events and these physical events and, um, and really sort of getting the best of both worlds. And so thank you very much, Rob. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It was an honor to have you on. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining the live stream. And goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Rob. Bye.